I Write What I Like by Steve Pantu Pico Chapter 9 The Definition of Black Consciousness We have in our policy manifesto defined blacks as those who are by law or tradition politically, economically and socially discriminated against as a group in the South African society and identifying themselves as a unit in the struggle towards the realization of their aspirations. This definition illustrates to us a number of things. 1. Being black is not a matter of pigmentation. Being black is a reflection of a mental attitude. 2. Merely by describing yourself as black, you have started on a road towards emancipation. You have committed yourself to fight against all forces that seek to use your blackness as a stamp that marks you out as a subservient being. From the above observations, we can see that the term black is not necessarily all-inclusive. The fact that we are all non-white does not necessarily mean that we are all black. Non-whites do exist and will continue to exist for quite a long time. If one's aspiration is whiteness, but his pigmentation makes attainment of this impossible, then that person is a non-white. Any man who calls a white man bars, any man who serves in the police force or security branch, is ipso facto a non-white. Black people, Real black people are those who can manage to hold their heads high in defiance rather than willingly surrender their souls to the white man. Briefly defined, therefore, black consciousness is in essence the realization by the black man of the need to rally together with his brothers around the cause of their operation, the blackness of their skin, and to operate as a group in order to rid themselves of the shackles that bind them to perpetual servitude. It seeks to demonstrate the lie that black is an aberration from the normal which is white. It is a manifestation of a new realization that by seeking to run away from themselves and to emulate the white man, blacks are insulting the intelligence of whoever created them black. Black consciousness, therefore, takes cognizance of the deliberateness of God's plan in creating black people black. It seeks to infuse to the black community a newfound pride in themselves, in their efforts, in their value systems, in their culture, in their religion, and in their outlook to life. The interrelationship between the consciousness of the self and the emancipatory program is of paramount importance. Blacks no longer seek to reform the system because doing so implies acceptance of the major points around which the system revolves. Blacks are out to completely transform the system and to make of it what they wish. Such a major undertaking can only be realized in an atmosphere where people are convinced of the truth inherent in their standing. Liberation, therefore, is of paramount importance. In the concept of black consciousness, we cannot be conscious of ourselves and yet remain in bondage. We want to attain the envisioned self, which is a free self. The surge towards black consciousness is a phenomenon that has manifested itself throughout the so-called third world. There is no doubt that discrimination against the black man the world over fetches its origin from the exploitative attitude of the white man. Colonization of white countries by whites has throughout history resulted in nothing more sinister than mere cultural or geographical fusion at worst. Or language bastardization at best, it is true that the history of weaker nations is shaped by bigger nations. But nowhere in the world today do we see whites exploiting whites on a scale even remotely similar to what is happening in South Africa. Hence, one is forced to conclude that it is not coincidence that black people are exploited. It was a deliberate plan which has culminated in even the so-called black independent countries not attaining any real independence. With this background in mind, we are forced 
to believe that it is a case of haves against have-nots. Where whites have always been the haves and the blacks have always been the have-nots. There is, for instance, no worker in the classical sense among whites in South Africa. For even the most downtrodden white worker still has a lot to lose if the system is changed. He is protected by several laws against competition at work from the majority. He has a vote and he uses it to return the nationalist government to power because he sees them as the only people who, through job reservation laws, are bent on looking after his interests against competition with the natives. It should therefore be accepted that an analysis of our situation in terms of one's color takes care of the greatest single determinant for political action, which is color, while also validly describing the blacks as the only real workers in South Africa. It immediately kills all suggestions that there could ever be effective rapport between the real workers, who are black, and the privileged white workers, since we have shown that the latter are the greatest supporters of the system. True enough, the system has allowed so dangerous an anti-black attitude to build up amongst whites that it is even taken as almost a sin to be black, and hence the poor whites, who are economically nearest to the blacks, demonstrate the distance between themselves and the blacks by an exaggerated reactionary attitude towards blacks. Hence, the greatest anti-black feeling is to be found amongst the very poor whites whom the class theory calls upon to be with black workers in the struggle for emancipation. This is the kind of twisted logic that the black consciousness approach seeks to eradicate. In terms of black consciousness, our approach seeks to recognize the existence of one major force in South Africa. This is white racism. It is the one force against which all of us are pitted. It works with unnerving totality, featuring both on the offensive and in our defense. Its greatest ally to date has been the refusal by us to club together as blacks because we are told to do so would be racialist. So while we progressively lose ourselves in a world of colorlessness and amorphous common humanity, whites are deriving pleasure and security in entrenching white racism and further exploiting the minds and bodies of the unsuspecting black masses. Their agents are ever present amongst us, telling us that it is immoral to withdraw into a cocoon, that dialogue is the answer to a problem, and that it is unfortunate that there is white racism in some quarters. But you must understand that things are changing. These, in fact, are the greatest racists, for they refuse to credit us with any intelligence to know what we want. Their intentions are obvious. They want to be barometers by which the rest of the white society can measure feelings in the black world. This is then what makes us believe that white power presents itself in totality, not only provoking us, but also controlling our response to the provocation. This is an important point to note because it is often missed by those who believe that there are a few good whites. Sure, there are a few good whites, just as much as there are a few bad blacks. However, what we are concerned here is group attitudes and group politics. The exception does not nullify the rule it merely substantiates it. What we are concerned with here is group attitudes and group politics, for the exception does not nullify the rule, it merely substantiates it. The overall analysis, therefore, based on the Hegelian theory of dialectic materialism, is as follows, that since the thesis is a white racism, there can only be one valid antithesis, a solid black unity to counterbalance the scale. If South Africa is to be a land where black and white live together in harmony without fear of group exploitation, it is only when these two opposites have interplayed and produced a viable synthesis of ideas and a modus vivendi, where we can never wage any struggle 
without a strong counterpoint to the white races that permeate our society so effectively. One must immediately dispel the thought that black consciousness is merely a methodology or a means towards an end. What black consciousness seeks to do is to produce at the output end of the process real black people who do not regard themselves as appendages to white society. This truth cannot be reversed. We do not need to apologize for this because it is true that the white systems have produced through the world a number of people who are not aware that they too are people. Our adherence to values that we set for ourselves can also not be reversed because it will always be a lie to accept wide values as necessarily the best. The fact that a synthesis may be attained only relates to the adherence to power politics. Someone somewhere along the line will be forced to accept the truth and here we believe that ours is the truth. The future of South Africa in the case where blacks adopt black consciousness is a subject for concern, especially amongst initiates. What do we do when we have attained our consciousness? Do we propose to kick whites out? I believe personally that the answers to these questions ought to be found in the CESO policy manifesto and in our analysis of the situation in South Africa. We have defined what we mean by true integration and the very fact that such a definition exists does illustrate what our standpoint is. In any case, we are much more concerned about what is happening now than what will happen in the future. The future will always be shaped by the sequence of present day events. The importance of black solidarity to the various segments of the black community must not be understated. There have been in the past a lot of suggestions that there can be no viable unity amongst blacks because they hold each other in contempt. Coloreds despise Africans because they, the former, by their proximity to the Africans, may lose the chances of assimilation into the white world. Africans despise the Khalids and the Indians for a variety of reasons. Indians not only despise Africans, but in many instances also exploit the Africans in job and shop situations. All these stereotype attitudes have led to mountainous intergroup suspicions amongst the blacks. What we should do at all times is to look at the fact that one, we are all oppressed by the same system. Two, that we are oppressed to varying degrees is a deliberate design to stratify us, not only socially, but also in terms of aspirations. Three, it is to be expected that in terms of the enemy's plan, there must be the suspicion. And that if we are committed to the problem of emancipation to the same degree, it is part of our duty to bring to the attention of black people the deliberateness of the enemy's subjugation scheme. Four, we should go on with our program, attracting to it only committed people and not just those who are eager to see an equitable distribution of groups amongst our ranks. This is a game common among liberals. The one criterion that must govern us is our commitment to action. Further implications of black consciousness are to do with correcting false images of ourselves in terms of culture, education, religion, economics, and so on and so forth and stuff like that. The importance of this also must not be understated. There is always an interplay between the history of a people, the past, and their faith in themselves, and the hopes they have for the future. We are aware of the terrible role played by our education and religion in creating amongst us a false understanding of ourselves. We must therefore work out schemes not only to correct this, but further to be our own authorities rather than wait to be interpreted by others. Wise can only see us from the outside, and the such can never extract and analyze the ethos in the black community. 
In summary, therefore, one needs only to refer this house to the CESO policy manifesto, which carries most of the salient points in the definition of black consciousness. I wish to stress again the need for us to know very clearly what we mean by certain terms and what our understanding is when we talk of black consciousness.